Okay, why don't you go ahead and get uh, started, Roger. Uh, this is a discussion uh, about um, how support for NASA, the science on NASA missions has been going. I've been, you know, whining about uh, uh, the research and data analysis programs, uh, but, but science is also conducted by science teams, you know, on missions. So turn it over to you, Roger. Okay, so I have three slides, but I hope they generate a lot of discussion. So the main slide is this one. And <clears throat> the uh, I've been tracking uh, how much funding COIs are getting from various missions. The data that's on this plot comes from multiple people, including my own experiences. Uh, so if anybody wants to share their experiences, I can put data on the plot and I won't um, give out any names or anything. Um, <clears throat> but what this uh, shows is an overall declining budget for not just spacecraft teams, but also RNA funding, but mainly for spacecraft teams. And let me start back here in the mid 1970s with this point up here that is off the top of the chart at 1.4 million. So it started, um, <clears throat> well, I started graduate school and I was at MIT when I, uh, uh, the program managers for planetary astronomy and PG&G, planetary geology and geophysics, uh, did a site visit. And they were standing in the lab where I was, beside my bench where I was soldering on a board to make a spectrometer. And <clears throat> one of them said to um, my advisor, Tom McCord, that they had an unwritten rule. And remember, this is 1975. The unwritten rule was we won't fund anybody for under 300K a year because anything less than that, and they won't pay attention to the program. So here we are decades later where um, it's much lower um, and especially lower after uh, accounting for inflation. And so researchers are constantly struggling to, to get funding to do research. Now in the past, planetary missions have funded a lot of research, research that was needed to support the data that was gonna come down and to support the data as it was coming down and then post mission success. So we, we um, up through Cassini and each mission, there's been this saying in the planetary community that each mission says, oh, this is not like mission X. So like during Cassini, everybody would say, oh, this is not like Galileo. We don't have as much money. Well, the money keeps shrinking. Cassini, in my view, from my career, so my career started in the 70s, um, was probably the last mission that was reasonably funded to, to allow people to do science. And um, you can see in, a, in inflation adjusted numbers down there, you know, a little under 300,000 per COI. Um, and that's not bad. You could, you could uh, pay a fair amount of your salary, have a programmer, grad student, lab uh, tech support. So you could actually get things done. Um, <clears throat> Now, upcoming missions, flagship missions like Europa, which is uh, what, $4 billion or something like that, um, pre-launch or pre-encounter with Jupiter, pre-orbit insertion, the COI budgets are really a couple of tens of K over a couple of years. So all the numbers are down on the deck. So there's no funding to do any science or even preparation for the data coming in pre-encounter and then after we go into orbit the proposed and this is after a lot of complaints by the the science teams um, the amount of money a co-investigator will get will be one half fte now that half fte has to be split up however the co-i wants so if, if the co-i wants a lab tech they take it out of their salary if they want to do a trip they have less salary so it's it's Whatever your salary is, half FTE plus overhead, that's what is given to um, your institution for, for your work. So, so there's very, very little science, even post-orbit um, insertion, because 
you know, the teams also have to manage the instrument plan, the observations and so, and, you know, so on. So it, evaluate the data as it comes down to be sure it's okay. So there's effectively no money for science at all. Um, <clears throat> this has a lot of implications uh, with with the declining budgets for science on missions of all sorts, big missions especially, researchers have to turn to the RNA programs. Now we, um, I'm going to go to the next slide. There, can you see my cursor? The, the like, pink yeah. column here um, shows um, snapshots of, of the um, rates. Mark put together this plot of um, uh, RNA selection rates and Boy, back in the 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s, I myself, I know, and, and talking with colleagues, uh, selection um, success was 80, 90 plus percent. And then by the mid 2000s, it's down under 50%, and now it's down under 20%. So the implications for this are profound. So the, there's more pressure on the RNA uh, programs for for funding more people are going to them because um, missions aren't supporting so the selection rates are going down because the dollars are fixed and <clears throat> but there are bigger um, implications and that's my third slide here so overall first uh, mission support for science is steadily eroded over decades and uh, very little science now this leads researchers to increasingly turn to RNA programs to get support for science needed for those missions. Now, the RNA selection rates are so low, missions therefore have very low chance of getting the needed science funded. So missions are going to happen, basically a data collection effort for, for future researchers who will have to struggle with low selection rates to even analyze the data. RNA programs discourage funding for researchers more than a half of an FTE. So if you're a researcher on all soft money, statistically, you need to write on the order of 20 or more proposals per year to statistically be fully funded. That's, that's really um, bad. It, it's really going to discourage new, new blood coming into the field, and a lot of people are going to drop out because they can't get funded. So NASA planetary science is becoming a, a part-time endeavor at best and a volunteer effort, except for a lucky few researchers who, uh, even researchers at like JPL, APL, or NASA centers, um, they are very few are full-time researchers. They use, do other jobs, you know, working on missions. So um, very few planetary scientists these days are full-time researchers. So discussion with colleagues in other fields, and, and um, when I was at the US Geological Survey, um, I developed uh, relationships with colleagues in other agencies, EPA, um, DOE, uh, even some DOD. And situation seems similar across all of American science. I, I don't, can't say it's as bad as NASA planetary, but uh, there's a, a downward trend. There's also, I didn't put this on the slide, but part of this, at least in planetary, is driven by the planetary community itself because um, universities turn out students. So the, the number of people in the field uh, are, is growing and the dollars are relatively fixed. So as a result, with um, more people feeding at the trough, there's less food per person. So, um, I mean, we can, we can whine amongst ourselves, but unless we go to the larger community and, and uh, uh, raise awareness, including Congress and, and the public, uh, the situation will likely just get worse. So we need to reverse this situation. So that's my presentation and I welcome um, uh, comments, suggestions, uh, other uh -huh. insights. Yeah, I would suggest that that you know people want to uh, chime in, just unmute and and have at it. And uh, uh, and I'd like to start by saying that yeah, that, that you've painted a a, a certainly a, a grim picture for for people in our profession. But if we if we say take personal pain aside, and 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 look at it from 
you know, what do we, NASA's, NASA is funding science missions to go out and do science. So what do we need a science team for prior to getting to the target? What do we need a science team for when we're at the target? And what do we need a science team for after the, the end of the mission? You know, because, because uh, I, I think that the without, without clearly articulating that uh, and, and, and because is this, is this something that, well, we don't need these people or not having these people is a failure on the part of NASA to adequately plan for and manage, manage these projects that are being funded by the public. You know, I, I, I think it'd be useful to, if you could articulate for the class uh, your view of what the role, the importance of having a science team, a well-funded science team, pre, post encounter and after the end of the mission. Okay, I, yeah, I can address that. The, so um, first the science team is selected for oh, their- I'm sorry, and, and I'm saying this is all being recorded too. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Well, just for That's other good. Yeah. yeah, let's get it on YouTube and get it out there. Um, uh, uh, yeah, there's probably some NASA management aren't going to like what I say, but <laughs> um, we're all zoomed anyway. So no. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the the science team first is selected for their expertise on a, a subject. You know, the subject of what the mission is about. So so you know they're generally. Um, the more experienced, uh, knowledgeable people in this area. So they have insights that are the mission needs. When, uh, and that goes from the science, but also to build the instrument and oversee the building of the instrument such that um, it'll get the measurements adequately with adequate signal to noise and resolution to actually answer questions. So without the scientists who have that knowledge, you know, engineers can come up with great instruments, but will they solve the problem? Second, and let me pick on Europa uh, Clipper mission in particular, because it's, it's the um, other missions uh, that we've, we've gone through, like Mars missions and, and um, even Cassini. Uh, we didn't have as much of a lack of knowledge as we do for Europa. And Europa is a very difficult environment with a lot of radiation. That radiation impacts the, the surface and modifies materials on the surface. So if we're going to interpret habitability, we need to understand the, the radiation and the radiation effects on the materials on the surface. That is sorely lacking in the scientific data. And, and for example, there's been a controversy since Galileo of uh, whether what's on the surface of Europa is salts versus acid. Salts coming up from an um, under the ice ocean or is the signature acids due to radiation processing of materials on the surface. So, I mean, that's a very fundamental question. That controversy still exists today because the appropriate research has not been done to definitively show what the answer is. And the, the Galileo NIMS data is there, adequate signal to noise and spectral range to actually answer the question. And so there's multiple camps battling uh, what the right answer is. And, and maybe both are there, but until we have the lab data, we won't be able to interpret new data from Clipper appropriately. Uh, it, so it's very frustrating to see Basically, most of my career, this controversy exists when, um, I don't know, a few million dollars in lab research could solve, get the data to solve the problem. And this is something that's needed before we get to Europa again. But on the books now, there's no money to do that research. Well, and so, ideally, you even want it before, you know, I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't it perspective or possibly feed into the instrument design? If yes, like, it could. Oh, the distinguishing thing is over here. Therefore, we need to have an instrument with this capability. And Absolutely. So, and so if you already define your instruments and now you're determining what they're going to need to measure in order to answer a fundamental question, but without Absolutely. knowing whether it's going to do that in advance. Yeah, we do have enough information, lab data, to know that answer. And, and we've designed uh, the MISE instrument 
um, on Clipper to to do the right thing, and it, it, it's looking very good in that regard. As long as we have the lab data to to back it up, and and doing lab data on materials with radiation doses, it can take a week per sample. So we needed to start this work many years ago in order to have enough knowledge of different materials and not only dosing we have to do it as a function of temperature and cryogenic temperatures to answer the europa questions so then second um, once you have an instrument and you start taking data these are you know very state-of-the-art instruments in very difficult environments in particular europa with radiation so calibration of the instrument is it can be challenging and uh, the science team because they work with the instrument understand its idiosyncrasies and what artifacts might be in the data because if you just throw the data out there and somebody who uh, we've seen this time and time again some other researcher takes the data and starts interpreting they might interpret some artifact as some feature and publish a paper on it and if the review panel isn't aware of that the um you know this can get into the literature and that causes more confusion down the road and if just science team was involved uh with that researcher we, and we tried to do some of this on cassini um when when there were other people working with the data and a lot of people collaborated with cassini team members to help that and and i've seen this on other instruments too so on other missions but um <clears throat> in particular you know it, it's one thing for images images are generally pretty clean there can be uh cosmic ray spikes and stuff but when you start getting to, into more uh advanced instruments like um, uh, mass spectrometers imaging spectrometers um, there's a lot of subtleties in the data that need to be properly interpreted and so you need the expertise that know the idiosyncrasies of that instrument so that's during the mission you might find things that you might need to change software for the for the instrument and then post mission um, you're still improving calibration and um, uh, uh, you know that can affect interpretations and so working with other researchers that find things you may not have seen it but they should be working with the science team so the science well, teams should be better funded to work with other researchers Mm -hmm. Well, and and also you you seem to you're, 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 that you, what you've talked about is is basically uh, uh, in the context of where you think you know what you're going to see, you know when you get there, and 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 I think of the Don mission uh, uh, that I was on, and 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 Dave Williams is on here, and, and others as well, and and where you go to an object and you start things seeing seeing things that you didn't know were there, and now you have to consider making some modifications to the operating plan uh, in order to, you know, be, 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 because, because these are science missions and we want to maximize the science return from these missions. I, I hear people on the Hill talk all the time, uh, uh, both Democrats and Republicans, about uh, maximizing the science for the public investment in the research. And so when we're spending a lot of money to send in an expensive piece of equipment you know, into the solar system, uh, you know, if we'd just done Dawn and said, oh, we know it's going to be there. And so we don't need a science team and, and we'll just do orbits of this thing and, and we'll, we'll, we'll get longitudinal coverage and, and then we'll analyze the data in the data analysis program after the fact, we would have left an awful lot on the floor. Yeah. You know, Same with every mission I've been on. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's that's one thing I think is really predictable about missions is that in the solar system missions is that is that when we get someplace that we haven't been before, and a lot of times when we've been there before too, we see things that that is like, oh, what's that? You know, exactly, and it's a big deal. Yeah. So uh, uh, um, let me point out another thing that is typical, and and here, um, you know, here's Cassini pre-launch. Here's launch, budgets start to grow as, as we're getting closer to orbit insertion. Uh, well, actually, we went into orbit insertion in 2004 right here. Um, budgets continue to ramp up during the prime mission, and then they decrease. So as you go into extended mission, they cut the budget. So you, you have more data, you're, you're proposing to answer more complex questions, and yet the budget goes down. The science budget should go up. 
the science budget should be separate from operations and and engineering budgets and as the questions get harder and the data become um, more to do more to analyze you need more more funds to do it well and 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 and, and so i've served on a lot of I think all of the senior review panels for extended missions over the past six years or whatever it is, uh, chaired a couple of them, and 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 yeah, there comes a point where some missions I won't I won't mention them, but but it's only like one or two, where it's like okay, you you've, you've kind of sucked the marrow out of this, uh, you know, in terms of given what you've got and what you can do, uh, and and how much it would cost to keep you going, but but the other missions, you know. Uh, uh, very impressive, very imp impressive proposals coming in about new science that weren't even thinking about, you know, back when the uh, mission started that uh, are, are now are, are, are to be pursued. We've got the sunk costs in the mission and, and, but they come in with guideline uh, budgets and I don't know out of whose orifice, you know, these things get pulled, but, but there's, oh, we'll just cut the budget 10%. Okay, by this time, the operating budget's been, been trimmed down to about as, as low as can go, and it may be like 80%, which means that your starting point is cutting the science budget in half. Yeah. And, 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 and I know that uh, uh, since the last spate of senior reviews, that almost all these missions have had their extended uh, uh, mission budget slashed, you know, the science slashed, because of cost overruns with Mars 2020. And, uh, and other things. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think I don't think the people are getting much uh, 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 bang for their buck when that, when that's being done. Let's see. We've got some things in chat. I'll pull that up here. While you're pulling that up, uh, one other thing that uh, with the shrinking budgets and shrinking science team budgets. Um, for the first time ever, a couple of years ago, I was asked to be on a science team as a collaborator. That means volunteer your time for free. I declined. But we've got other people who've, who've got, you know, mission experience on here. Feel free to chime in because Roger and I could probably talk forever. So uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, Elizabeth Sklute was saying, don't forget what happened with the iron calibration on MER and the calibration for LIBS on SuperCam. Both were lacking before the instrument hit the surface. Impacts the efficiency and overall success of the data collection. So yeah, we, we, we go in with arms tied behind our backs and, and, and stuff like that when we're not doing the homework in advance. Yeah. And I know on Cassini, uh, I was on Cassini VIMS, uh, visual and infrared mapping spectrometer uh, and did the calibration for the instrument. And we did a pretty good calibration post uh, um, the end of Cassini. But in that calibration, we uh, found that we could do even better. We, we have some uh, artifacts that are at critical wavelengths that uh, need to be calibrated out. And we could find other uh, compounds if we had a better calibration. And some of us have proposed post Cassini to improve that calibration for the entire community, for the entire data set, and it's always been declined. So, um, um, yeah, so I guess that the level of funding for um, Europa Flipper uh, science team members, and, and are there even, I mean, this is per member, but what about the number the size of the teams is, is like Europa Clipper science team even appropriately sized. Um, that's been a controversy within uh, Europa Clipper. Uh, some teams are quite lean. Uh, the Mize team uh, that I'm on is is pretty lean. Uh, there's a couple of teams with a lot of team members, and uh, uh, some have questioned. Uh, if all those team members are needed. So, I mean, that's a constant debate. It depends on the complexity of your instrument and the job you have to do. So there's no one size fits all, uh, but it, it does need to be looked at. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, there's a kind of attitude on the part of people at the headquarters that, well, you know, you scientists, you're just trying to get away with something. <laughs> you know, that, that, that we're, we're well, I, I don't, well, there's, there's, 
there's the goal of trying to keep things small to yep. save money, though it's kind of penny wise and foolish given given the context of the overall cost of the mission. Yeah, the science budget on a typical mission is a pretty small fraction of the engineering budget to get the spacecraft there in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else feel free to chime in? I mean, one of the things that, well, one of my bet noirs, growing bet noirs, is, uh, is the whole idea of level one requirements. That it's like, what is the minimum that we can do and have a likelihood of, of be able to wave the 100% success flag as opposed to, okay, we're targeting this stuff. What's the most we could do with this, with this mission? You know, what, what's the most we might be able to, to learn and, and to have a, a more uh, ambitious set of goals where if we say we got 60% of it, that would be spectacular. Yeah, you know, exactly. Because, yeah. These are these are these are supposed to be science missions. These are not supposed to be NASA press release opportunities, and and are designed for that you know purpose. That that and and that you know as a person who pays taxes, uh, I'd kind of like to see the most we can squeeze out of these things. I know that uh, uh, you know there's a lot of desire by by. You know, people in the halls at headquarters that uh, yeah, it'd be nice if you just turn it off. You know, turn off, turn off the mission. You know, some of these things like those little little Mars rovers that could, right? That went, went on to their eleventh extended mission. And, but but I'll tell you, uh, uh, when I was on uh, the panel for uh, um, uh, the 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 senior reviews for the missions that included uh, New Horizons and Mer. Uh, Squires was talking about MERS, Stearns was talking about uh, uh, New Horizons, and and it was completely compelling. It was, in fact, I I I was telling tell, we need to be recording this, and we need to we need to collect their their proposals. And anybody who wants to uh, do a, a, a future uh, proposals for an extended mission, watch this, read this, and come back. And and God knows it would make our jobs a lot easier the, uh, as as reviewers, but 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 also just uh, the quality of, of the of the science being proposed. Even even Mur, you know, even Mur in its eleventh year or whatever the hell it was at the at the time, that that you know Squires made a very effective case that that there was important science to, to yet to be done with this with this by you know some standards modest. Uh, 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 spacecraft. So yeah, exactly. The more I mean, you spend so many really hundreds of millions of dollars to get there. And then a few million to do science is, you know, small in comparison and uh, needs to be encouraged as much as possible. But, but at the same time, the volatility is in the flagships, you know, new frontiers, you know, discovery, these are cost gap missions. Okay, you could have additional funds in extended missions, but that's all predictable. You know, so, so you, you can put out five-year budgets and have a really good solid you know, research programs. You don't have cost overruns because they'll just say no if you ask for more money yeah, and, you know, for, for an existing research project or data analysis project. So, so these things are very uh, uh, well-defined, stable uh, uh, expenditures that NASA uh, can undertake in a planned way from one year to the next. Uh, you know, these multi-billion dollar, you know, flagship missions, that's where the volatility comes in because you're doing something ambitious. You're doing some, something, something novel and uh, you didn't quite have everything figured out. And, 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 and you know, now suddenly, I, well, of course, the poster child for this of, for all time is JWST, but, you know, for other, say, less ambitious missions, you know, you, you still have a lot and NASA's uh, policy uh, is uh, cannibalism. That if you have overruns, well, you look to these extended missions, you look to current missions, you look to research programs and say, well, what can we do to carve out money from that so we can throw it to this problem? Uh, when they should be saying, or the administration should be saying, okay, um, you're going to have to not do this one, or we're going to have to go back to Congress and say, you know, we need more money. 
and uh, and then leave it in the hands of Congress. And yeah, and that they will give you. There's there's a lot of um, reticent to go back to Congress for more money because you know you get raked over the coals for that. Right, um, right, right. But look at all the look look at all the diminished science return you get from the missions that you're reducing their science budgets sure. for, reducing their you know ongoing you know the, the, for prime missions for for research programs. So, you know, back in back in the day when we used to uh, rack and stack proposals, you know, uh, research proposals to determine which were the best ones and, and all that, and where's the water line before NASA started hiding that information. And they're the only in, they're the only federal agency that hides that information from review panels. Uh, that that um, um, you know, we would say, hey, uh, uh, here here's a, a highly ranked uh, proposal, but it's really expensive. And so the question is, is not, is its science more important than the next one, but is the, is, is its science more important than the next three or four together? And so I think one can ask if you were to come up, if you were to sum up all the lost science, you know, that's, that, that's incurred when you start rating things, um, you know, that would be an interesting discussion to have. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I, I think that we ought to, uh, but what I would propose, um, and who knows what the decadal is going to do. Oh my God, there's already four flagships scheduled for the next 20, 30 years. You know, what's the point of even recommending anything? But, but uh, uh, you know, I, I think that we need to protect our discovery and new frontiers programs, protect our research and data analysis programs against the volatility of the big boys and that uh, if they run into problem then you're going to have to go hat and hand up to the hill and yeah. and, 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 if, and if there was that prospect then maybe um, some <clears throat> organizations which shall not be named uh, uh, would work a little harder at controlling costs you know if they knew that if they bust the budget that's what's going to happen let me address, you know, so if, if public views this, some of the issues with cost overruns, and, and I'll pick on Europa again, and uh, more to defend it, because yes, costs have grown. Um, but Europa, like many missions, especially when you're going there and to do some new detail, you're, you're doing instruments that have, you know, while there may be heritage, they're state of the art. So uh, trying to get these to do measurements that have never been done before is challenging. And in the case of getting to Jupiter, you're in a radiation environment and that radiation is detrimental to, to um, instrument health. And, and for example, on, on our own instrument, on MISE, on Europa Clipper and an imaging spectrometer, we found that we had a design and, and we were moving along real well. And then we found that the literature, the engineering literature on some of the optical components weren't quite clear. And literally, the, there was a transmission measurement uh, for, um, if I remember right, zinc selenide. And um, um, <clears throat> maybe it was another component. I'm, I'm forgetting now because this was several years ago. Uh, but we found that the the literature didn't quite tell the whole story. It told the absorption, but not the scattering component. And so we had to change out this uh, material for a different optical element that works in the infrared. And then it got into uh, other issues with other, other compounds, like can it withstand the, the temperature and the radiation environment? And so that just drives up costs. And you right, right, but you can these, put those you, you hit the these all the time. In, you, you put these increased costs in the in, in, in the in the budget request for the next year. Okay, we're going to need more money, and so you put it in the budget. Yeah, you do, and and you know it's, it's like uh, 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 when I was talking to the uh, steering steering uh, uh, committee, uh, uh, you know, saying this rounds back in March, saying that RNA should be funded at five hundred million dollars starting out in twenty three. You know, which is about 25% of the flight mission budget. And, uh, 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 and so um, uh, using 2020 numbers uh, that I got under FOIA. And, and, uh, uh, and, and so uh, Steve, Steve Reinhardt uh, type, typed in the question, 
uh, well, so what missions are you going to cut in order to fund all this RNA? And my answer is, you don't, you don't cut anything. You ask Congress for the money that you want for your RNA programs, for your various mission programs. And if you got more expenses that are coming up as a consequence, well, you detail that and you increase the, you increase that budget, you know, in the in the next year's uh, thing. You know, you, the OMB needs to sign up for it. The administration needs to sign up for it if they want to do it. If they want to do that mission. And so, uh, uh, transparency is a good thing. You know, being honest with with uh, the taxpayers, being honest with the appropriators is is a good thing. Because when you hide stuff and then you're caught out, then it upsets people. And uh, uh, so I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, and I think that you end up having less support for, for doing some of these ambitious things you'd like to, uh, to undertake. So uh, yeah, I agree that the, you try new, developing new kinds of instruments to operate in new kinds of environments, it's gonna get more expensive yeah. and that's fine. And that should be a reason for then increasing the request for that budget line in the next year's budget. Well, there's, there's a couple of other options. And one is for the existing money, do fewer missions and fund each mission better, and, and especially fund the science better. And another thing is there must be enough history and uh, understanding at NASA to know what the cost growth is going to be for a particular type mission, especially, you know, like a radiation environment where you have so many unknowns. So maybe you should have a, a, a greater uh, buffer in there for cost growth when you well, first propose and that, the mission. And that would make sense, but then there's some organizations that will that will increase their costs to accommodate the, 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 the whatever, whatever buffer exists. <laughs> there, there, it, it, there's all kinds of people that game the system. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I think there should be reasonable buffer, you know, re reasonable margin in these things. But at the end of the day, you know, and, and the mission science should be well funded uh, for before launch, before, you know, for in for development, for operations, and then post operations. And, uh, and then having done that and, and having, you know, set reasonable budgets and having, and I think that the, the, what we've had uh, at least recommended of, of, gee, it'd be nice to have five discovery missions a, a decade, you know, a couple of discovery, a couple of New Frontiers missions a decade, one flagship mission a decade, except that we're doubling that. We're doubling, we're doubling the flagship rate. And, and uh, you know, so, uh, it, but it'd be nice to have, uh, this whole architecture of, uh, of uh, different mission si sizes and, um, uh, and be able to maintain that for, for a while. Um, but I think, I, I think it won't happen. I, and I think we're in a really dangerous time now because with four flagships in the offing, and that is the, let's go pick up the, uh, the, the samples on the Martian surface, that's one flagship. Let's return it to the earth from Mars orbit, that's another flagship. Europa Clipper and Europa Lander. That's four. And uh, yeah. uh, I, I think that it puts at risk everything else, you know, uh, uh, unless, unless, unless we get some different management at NASA and some better understanding by administration and by people on the Hill that um, it's a good time to retire. Because <laughs> the next 20 years could be uglier than we've ever seen. So. Yeah, we say that every every year. <laughs> yeah, but I have a reason for it. You know, it's, it's, it's not just because of past practice. It's because of look what's on the table now and compare yeah. what's been on the table in the past. Look well, at where the volatility and costs are. And look this chart the is showing we're reaching rock bottom. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we'll get somebody in another country to analyze our data. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that, that that'll happen. Well, uh, let me tell you, as Cassini moved on, we looked more and more to the Europeans to do things that we just couldn't do. I'm couldn't really impressed because, by because, our European colleagues. Because uh, intelligence suppression or couldn't do because you just didn't have the money to send didn't, the paper. Didn't have the money to do it. And, and yeah. uh, they ramped up been solved a lot of problems yeah 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 no, I, 
it'd be nice to get more benefit out of our, our programs so and our missions. So, um, but we can only do that if we fund it. Um, floor is always open for more comments to butt us out. Maybe they're all in shock. I <laughs> see. <laughs> uh, um, I hear about how the planetary science industry is just stealing taxpayer money for something no one wants. Uh, except when we actually do something, then everybody's glued to their tubes. Um, yeah, I, 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 I do. And, and the, I agree that we do, have, we do have a responsibility to taxpayers who get as much out of the money we put in as possible for not doing the science. We're just selling up a really expensive show of force or proof, uh, proof we can. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're, if you're launching a science mission, you're not going to do the science. It kind of undermines the argument for doing the mission to begin with. And all of you, Roger, you're moving your lips, but I'm not hearing you at all. No, I, I wasn't talking. I was agreeing with you. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, uh, that that yeah, I, I think that I think that this the, the decline that you show, Roger, here is is an argument for, hey, if we just want a picture, can't we do that cheaper? You know, get some cheaper SpaceX uh, things, shoot it out there, get a picture, and we're done. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, in response to you know that comment, yeah, the the public needs to understand that. I mean, it's just like with people, and and for example, um, um, we need to understand the Earth as a system in order to understand climate change better. In fact, you know, the whole warming thing came about from from um, models of uh, Venus atmosphere back um, probably what the 60s or or so mm -hmm. so but understanding planetary formation and evolution is important to understanding the earth and its evolution formation and evolution just like if you want to understand people you don't just look at one subject you got to look at whole populations and so this is true of uh, un understanding our own solar system helps us understand the earth and also understanding the evolution of of other solar systems to to know you know what could happen here if some different scenario started to happen so yeah we need to understand our earth because we're having a big impact on it and uh, planetary sciences is, is important and there are also other implications planetary science uh, is developing state-of-the-art tools and those those things uh, go into other applications and for example, on Cassini, um, and this was 2010, if you remember the, the Gulf oil spill, um, I had just published a paper on Titan where I had done measurements on or, organic compounds and measured absorption coefficients of materials in the infrared. And <clears throat> uh, I came out of a backcountry trip studying um, um, uh, crypto and uh, not crypto um, um, crypto uh, art Indian ancient Indian art in Canyonlands National Park and I was getting frantic calls about the the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico and if we could map the amount of uh, oil on the ocean surface and uh, like a fool I said well I just kind of did that on Titan so yeah I think we can do that and uh, so so we <laughs> did we we used Avaris, an imaging spectrometer that's flown by JPL and flew it over the, the oil spills and derived uh, a, a, the only estimate for the amount of ocean uh, oil on the ocean surface at the time. And that led to um, some of the first estimates of the amount of oil coming out of the oil, the, uh, you know, the, the break in at the bottom of the ocean there. And it was the, it was the mass balance uh, team uh, that I was part of, and and we came up with numbers that were far greater than were being reported. So, so here we had a direct application from a planetary mission that went on to to help with the the um, oil spill problem. And, and today, that that methodology is still being developed for future oil spills as a technique to to measure the amount of oil. Um, <clears throat> we also we also uh, follow on from uh, Avaris imaging spectroscopy work, which you know was planetary and terrestrial. Uh, 
um, map the uh, aftermath of the World Trade Center disaster, including looking for asbestos and, and other um, toxic materials in the debris. We also found the temperatures of the fires through the smoke. And so all of that's you know, a direct result of, of planetary and terrestrial uh, science funding. Yeah, so I was on a, a panel this morning for the NIAC uh, uh, conference, and and, uh, and one of the things we're talking about is is how you know, back back when I started in this business, I think when you started in this business too, Roger, you started before me, that uh, uh, you know planetary was primarily you know a lot of uh, telescope jockeys and meteorite people, and and but but now, you know over the de over the decades since. Uh, uh, there has been such a, a explosion of detailed information coming back from from other worlds, uh, uh, particularly Mars, uh, such that such that planetary science has really become compared to planetology, you know, and and Earth is a planet, and yep. and so we we, we take uh, uh, detailed models that have been developed on the Earth, like global circulation model, whatever, apply it to to Mars and, and, and go back in time to see where glaciation occurred and then see the evidence of it in the, in the, in the, in the geology. But what is that telling you? That's telling you that, you know, that global circulation model we got for the earth atmosphere works pretty goddamn good. And, and, and that we can, we, we can take it, you know, it's like taking the, the, the motor of a family car and putting it into a, a, a you know, a race car and take it around the, the race track, track a few times. It may not have been designed for that, but 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 when it works well in these different contexts, that should give people some real confidence in, in the predictions that are coming out uh, from these models about about where we live, and uh, um, and so the same thing we were hearing about that from uh, uh, Jonathan Lilly and, and the, the the turbulence in in, in currents, you know, and oceans and things, and then you know being able to relate that to well, and this is you see this right here on Jupiter, you know, it's it's it's, it's this very now that we have beautiful Jupiter images, which, uh, like I said this morning, is two words I would never have put together in a sentence before uh, uh, Junicam, which is beautiful on Jupiter. But uh, um, the, yeah, it, it really is a, a merger of, uh, of this. And, 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 and that's a good message to be you know, uh, getting out to the public. But, but unfortunately, with a lot of our communication, science communication in the public, it's conclusory statements. It's not the process of getting there. You know, and so and so they just see us as people in lab coats saying things, you know, uh, uh, in a conclusory way because we've got these degrees and we're smart, something like that. And then they can say, well, that's just an opinion, and and, <laughs> and go off in some other direction, uh, because what they're not being exposed to is, you know, well, we look at this, and we look at that, and we can we compare this, and oh, that doesn't work too well, so we try this, and blah blah blah, and then you, you give a sense of the real. Uh, of the process, which which for us can be fun, and 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 it would be nice to have, uh, whether it's news or whatever, to be able to maybe just have another channel or something where every soundbite you get out of a headline, uh, uh, where you can look under the hood a bit, but but in a in a in a fun way, and and uh, and the public could have an opportunity to learn something more about science as opposed to just opinion by by credentialed people so yep <laughs> oh well <laughs> well let's see it's 11 50 i guess we should get into q a <laughs> <laughs> we, we can get some comments here um yeah uh uh laura fackrell uh has commented here about uh yeah, communication with the public and um, skilled writers. Yeah, I, I, I think that all of us, you know, really should um, take it upon ourselves to take advantage of the opportunities that we have to speak to the public and convey, you know, again, this, this sense of what we do, you know, not just the cool, not, not just the headlines of what we know, but, but the process of, of, of what we do. And, um, um, you know, it, it's it sometimes we can learn things too. I, I, it, I haven't been given many public lectures in, in recent years, but uh, when I do, I always like to stick around at the end to take questions for as long as people want to ask. And so a lot of times that might be longer than the presentation, uh, but but that's great. And and um, 
So, but, but I'm also convinced that there isn't anything that we do that can't be conveyed to the public in a, in a uh, clear uh, uh, visual way. And um, uh, I got that from listening to, uh, um, God, was it David Tran? It was from University of Chicago back in the 70s, the Chicago series. He was talking about the Big Bang and, and he was going into a lot of you know, particle physics and Feynman diagrams and stuff like that. But he he had such thorough knowledge of his topic. He he was such a, a a good way of conveying it that that everybody in the room completely understand what he was talking about. It was it was very impressive. But but it just made me think that if he can do that, we can do our stuff because our stuff is a lot is a lot more hands on, understandable than 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 the stuff that he was he was conveying. So, but uh, but yeah, it's important for all of us to to. Talk to the public. Yeah. Yep. Oh, here we go. Yeah, uh, Michael, I, uh, I'm part of Amanda Hendricks Farmers Market Outreach Activity, and it's big fun. Both folks are interested in ask questions, so I guess they go out to farmers markets and, and set up a booth and 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 just talk with people. I, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> uh, uh, how do we do that? Uh, is it volunteer science? Can, uh, uh, yeah, largely it is volunteer science. You know, when we go out to speak to the public, you know, nobody's going to pay us to do that. But 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 you, you get appreciative audiences. Um, yeah, and and uh, you know, funding such a thing. Well, who's going to fund it? So either you know donors, uh, you know NASA. Well, NASA doesn't do education anymore. You know, it does engagement, not education. Can't use that word. <laughs> uh, but Mark, isn't that part of the problem that we want to bridge the gap between uh, scientists and the general public and scientists don't have any time to work for free, but we don't want to fund anybody to outreach to the general public. It seems like. Well, well NASA does. NASA, does, you mean, we, how do we get money? You know, how does any organization get money? It either gets it from like a federal agency like NASA or NSF or from donations, you know, something like that. And, and, but when you go to the funding agencies and they don't have, they're not really, they, NASA used to have this great program where they'd give you, you could apply for like a $15,000 grant to do some uh, public education, not science education. If you got an award from any of these research programs and then Three of you could get together, and that could be forty-five thousand dollars. And I thought I, I described it as the gateway drug for for scientists to get into uh, EPO. Uh, but they canceled all that, you know, uh, uh, a number of years ago, and and they don't do anymore. And so, I mean, w one has to advocate for that. But but and people do. But um, yeah, the, the the resources are very limited. You know, because I think our funding agencies themselves, and I can't speak for NSF because I don't have that much experience with NSF, but on the NASA side, they don't, they don't value it. Free to, you, can, free to, you know, if you got some other thoughts about that. But no, I agree with you. It's something that we should be doing. But right now, um, um, you know, being funded to do it, Nah, yeah, not going to happen. Uh, now we we are talking with some. We're we're, we're uh, setting up a PSI Chautauqua, uh, and this is like uh, uh, Nick Castle's uh, uh, "How to Live on Mars and Not Die," and but people would pay to to attend that that uh, class, and um, and we have some other people that we're talking about that want to provide course coursework online, but again, that's for a fee. People would pay for it. Uh, so, so, but going out to a general audience, you know, like, like my going down to Green Valley and talking to uh, a couple of hundred, you know, retirees uh, in, in a room, you know, they're, they're not going to want to pay for that. And, and, and so, you know, I, I, that, I do that for free, you know, so when the opportunity arises, talk to clubs, talk to school kids. Uh, and um, yeah, like I said, it's not a job, it's a lifestyle. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> and, but that's the way it's always, and, and that's the way it's always been. I mean, uh, my entire career, uh, oh Christ, 40 years, uh, <laughs> including graduate school, Christ, really, uh, that, that it's, you know, all the public engagement has been just getting out there and you get an invitation, you do an interview, you do a show, you go to a school, you go to a, 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 a uh, an event and, uh, you know, sit at a table um, um, uh, because it, it, it's a way of giving back to the people that are, are paying our salaries to do the science. And, um, um, you know, there's no easy way to do it other, other than just, you know, go out and, and volunteer, you know, at, at, at a school or whatever. There'd be a huge amount of money if NASA wanted to. They, they wanted to set a program to say, have you go out to, you know, spend a spend, you know, so many hours a week, and they'd, it'd probably be a day because you do have to do all the prep and all that kind of stuff, uh, uh, to to go out to the schools or someplace, and um, you know, multiply that by a couple thousand people, you know, uh, you know, over the course of say even just an academic year, and uh, that's a big chunk of change, but it might be worth actually thinking about, you know, what would that be? I just don't think it needs to be that expensive, right? You do it the way you do an NSF panel. You get everybody on a, a big Zoom call. We're all used to that in schools now. And you pay a couple scientists a per diem to come and answer questions to the general public on a given topic. It's a way to start. It's not the ideal scenario. But... Yeah, because it doesn't cover expenses at all. You know, you sit on these panels, they give you, they give you, you know, a few hundred bucks or whatever. And it's like, okay, thank you. Um, but, it may uh, not cover your expenses, but it does cover <laughs> my expenses. A really no, point taken, point life. taken. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so it's a big matter of sizing it up and 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 then seeing if a, if an agency would buy. You know, so, also, yeah, I'm, I'm, stuff changed. I mean, you know, when you were funded, you had two proposals and you funded 100% of your time. Then you had tons of time to go volunteer. But now you need to write 20 proposals. Where do you have the time to go volunteer? Mm -hmm. Right. And there's more committees to sit on. There's more panels they want you to do. There's more, you know, there, there's an infinite amount of free work that you're asked to do. Exactly. And, and, uh, you know, reviewing proposals and all that kind of stuff. And, and NASA you know, would look... So we would, we would look really bad if they wouldn't get all that volunteer work because they are there because the public likes what they're doing. But if we don't stop communicating with the public, then why, you know? So we could put it this way. Hey, NASA, we're doing all this free work. You're not saying you have to pay everything, but give us at least, you know, like, like Elizabeth said, start yeah, with yeah. something. And you know I'm happy to say? sit on a panel. Oh, they say, yeah, we don't do science. No, no they'll say, thank you. <laughs> but I was like, they're like, okay, then we stop communicating. And then what are they going to do? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Hey, all, it, 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 it's been an hour. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for, you know, participating, coming and, and, you know, uh, listening to this, I think that there's, uh, uh, it'll be very interesting to see what the Degadal survey does about about flagship missions, because uh, we've, like I said, we've got four in the offing right now. And so, uh, you know, that, that'll that be a chunk. But, um, um, but I think that we do have to uh, talk to people. Uh, um, I tend to think that talking to NASA's probably not going to do anything uh but but talk to our representatives about protecting the the science that we do by by uh, making sure that science missions do science and and provide good return on that investment and um that it shouldn't be you know that cannibalism is not a good thing any final, final thoughts roger no i think we summed it up pretty well